Wow, so we're going to conclude with one of the uh, most popular programs, Talk with the Doc, and we're bringing it live to all of you. So uh, first I'm going to share a little bit about Dr. Licklider, in case you don't know him. He's a movement disorder specialist neurologist from Allegheny Health Network. He received his MD degree at Temple University School of Medicine and then completed his internship and residency at Allegheny General Hospital. And he specializes in movement disorders such as essential tremor, Parkinson's, Huntington disease, dystonia, as well as other movement disorders. And he also conducts clinical research in areas of Parkinson's and Huntington's disease. So this will be a mini talk with the doc session. What we're going to do is um, we have microphones uh, with Lauren and Wes and Dwayne and and Christine. So please raise your hand, and we do ask that you just ask one question so we can keep it moving, and then Dr. Licklider will answer the question, and we'll, we'll have about 30 minutes, and then you can also tune in to the Zoom session, which is this coming Thursday, May 4th at 4.45 p.m., and then we'll have a quick word at the end, and then you can go see Jimmy and f visit the resource vendors for a final time. So come on up, Dr. Licklider. I don't, have, I don't have a computer in front of me to cheat, so don't expect all the answers. And I thought about bringing my, my backpack with 200 pounds in it, but <laughs> he, said, he said don't compare. I got nothing. Am I supposed to? Oh, I think it might be over there. Anybody? Go. Hold on. opinion as as to whether or not to do testing when diagnosing Parkinson's? Do you do anything like MRIs, those kinds of things when you're diagnosing, or is it just more um, shaking and that kind of thing? Sometimes. I, sh I should throw out, see, I wasn't prepared. Caveats that I always throw out, everything that I throw out is my opinion. Okay, that's my fine. My opinion could be different than everybody else's opinion, but I always, if, if you attend or listen to me on the computer, I always throw that out there. I forgot about that. And if I'm making stuff up, I will throw up some air quotation marks. The answer to your question is it depends. So generally, if I see somebody who looks pretty typical and mm -hmm. I say, hmm, I think you have Parkinson's disease, I probably won't do a lot of testing. It's generally a clinical diagnosis based on symptoms, tremors, stiffness, slowness of movement, balance problems. If anything is atypical or if I put somebody on medicine and I expect one thing and something different happens, that's a different story. Then I may do an MRI, I may do a DAT scan, we may do some blood work. Um, but generally, I guess it depends on the situation, it depends on what happens, it depends on what I'm looking at, how confident I am that I know what I'm doing or I know what I'm seeing, and then I go from there. The end. Does deep brain stim stimulation help with dyskinesia and with freezing of feet? Yes, and maybe. So we, we think of dyskinesia as a side effect of the medicine. And a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times after we do deep brain stimulator surgery, we're able to cut back medicines. It's not the goal of surgery. I tell my patients going in, I am not aiming to get you off of your medicine. I am not trying to take away your medicine. I'm trying to get you doing better. Usually takes a combination of stimulation and medication. But it turns out a lot of the times after surgery you're able to decrease medicine, and if the medicines are what's driving the dyskinesias, a lot of times you can make that a little bit better. Maybe not make it go away, but at least make it a little bit better. Freezing of gait, hesitation, these are really hard problems to fix. They don't respond all that well to medicine. They don't respond all that well to surgery. Occasionally, some people do get benefit from surgery with walking, with balance, with freezing of gait, but that's generally not one of the symptoms that I'm like, ah, this is a great idea for surgery. Doctor, so how do you become a patient for a clinical trial research? Uh, variable. Uh, so your best chance, again, in the place that I usually send people to is the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Literally on their website, they have every or most of the clinical trials that are going on right now listed. And a lot of times they have a contact number. So right now I have one trial going on, but it's not, it's not a, enrolling new patients, so don't call me. Um, UPMC, I think, usually has a few going on, including the Sparks trial, but I don't know if it's still enrolling. The short answer is you kind of have to start calling. So you, you either call, you send emails, sometimes there's links depending on how you find it, um, and you just try contacting them. 
And yes, um, UPMC continues to do trials. They have a table out here. Talk to them about the opportunities that they have going on, and you can learn more today. They actually left. They no, left. Right. Call the Parkinson Foundation. Call them. They'll, they'll get you there. Yes. Oh, hold on. We got. I, I can see the confusion there. Hello. She yes, got the did. microphone though. Parkinson. Um, I have a question about medication adjustment. When I was first diagnosed and was given um, the L-DOPA, I was twice a day. Then I was still having significant symptoms three times a day. Still significant system symptoms four times a day. I sleep late and I stay up late. So when I would go to bed, before I would go to bed, I would take number four. When I got up in the morning, I still had significant symptoms. I shook, my legs were weak, I was crashing into walls, and I, one night I had forgotten to take the dinner time dose. So I took two when I went to bed. That has helped enormously. Now, I don't have my doctors okay to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an old nurse, so I did it. <laughs> Nurses are the worst. Yeah. <laughs> but is that, should I continue like sure. that? Sure. Uh, you should talk to your doctor. Yeah, but, you say yeah, that. I mean, at the end of the day, everybody's different. And, and there's a thousand different ways to increase or change medicines. If you're my patient and you come to me, I have a certain way that I do it. I take people exactly the same way they did for you or we did for you. I layer in different medicines, really depending on what we're trying to accomplish. It dictates which medicine I use, because they all do something a little bit different. We use them all for something a little bit different, depending on what we're trying to accomplish. Um, my patients do whatever they want to. They don't listen to me either. Uh, all the time I hear, well, you know, I'm not really doing that. Actually, I'm doing this. And I say, OK, is it working? OK. It, it's really whatever works best for you. And if you need two pills at night to help you get through the night and feel better in the morning, well, then OK, that sounds like a reasonable plan. Again, check with your doctor. That's always a good idea to make sure everybody's on the same page. You need the team involved. Um, but a lot of times it's trial and error. What we do and how we try to get you doing better, it's a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of, well, let's try this with the medicine. Let's see what happens. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, we backtrack and we go this direction. And so you kind of did that on your own, which, again, I don't always recommend, but my patients tend to do anyway. Um, and so I think it's fine. You just have to communicate. Uh, so many of us with Parkinson's lost our sense of smell years before we presented other sy symptoms. And I've never heard, what does that have to do with any of this? It's a fun question. It, it makes me look like I know what I'm doing when I ask. And someone's like, how did you know? Party trick? I don't know. At the end of the day, we th depends on what you read. So there's a lot of information about the progression of Parkinson's disease, where it starts, how it progresses. You know, we ask things like, have you lost your sense of smell? Are you dealing with constipation? Do you act out dreams? Do you have REM behavior sleep disorder? Things that we know can come before you start shaking. Um, and we think it all depends on where it starts, how it travels through the nervous system, which areas of the nervous system it attacks and targets and affects first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And it probably has something to do with that, but not everybody does. So we don't really also know how, how that necessarily plays a role. Um, and we haven't figured out how to use that to our advantage yet. You know, we haven't really figured out, hey, you lost your sense of smell 10 years ago, and you tend to act out dreams and you have constipation. These are similar symptoms to what I see in Parkinson's disease. We don't know how to use that. You know, we don't have anything right now that's like, oh, we should do this now, except for exercise and start doing burpees, which all of my patients, I'm going to ask your burpee count next time you come back in. <laughs> um, but the short answer is it's something that we know goes along with Parkinson's disease. We know it oftentimes comes before the motor symptoms, but we haven't figured much out in terms of how to use that to our advantage or what to do with that yet. <clears throat> come to him next. He, he's got his hand up. Go ahead. No, I meant her first, and then I didn't want him to get missed. Go ahead. Okay. Um, what do you recommend, or have there been any new um, recommendations or medications for daytime restlessness and severe restless leg syndrome at night? 
I don't know that there's been any earth-shattering breakthroughs. I use the same medicines that we've had for quite some time. Um, so a lot of primapexol, a lot of horizon, the gabapentin, all the dopamine agonists, carbidopa, levodopa is thrown in there, and eventually you get to things like the pain medicines. But um, iron plays a particular role in that, and we know we have to work on that. Uh, iron infusions are being looked at, at least down at Hopkins, they're reporting things on that. So there are some things, but I don't think there's been any earth-shattering medications, at least not that I've heard of recently. With iron supplementation, oral uh, supplementation, how long does it generally take to... Um <laughs> Longer than most people want to take iron. Everybody hates taking iron. Um, it's constipating and nobody really likes it. But it does help some, um, but you have to be on it for a while. And it really does require some blood work. We have to see that your numbers are coming up, your ferritin level, your iron levels. And so it, it's, it's not as easy as we would like. Lauren, we have a gentleman back here, so while you get to the front. Uh Name is John Wall. Uh, my wife very kindly, uh, please. John Allison wants to remind people, I don't know, two people at our table didn't know that you could get your medications put in pill packs for a month at a time, and it is such a time saver. So. Can I give you some caution on pill packs? Oh, there he is. Pill packs are great. They make it easy. Two th I, as the doctor, two problems come up with pill packs. One is my patients have no idea what they're taking because the pack comes in, you open it, you take it. So you have to be careful, pay attention to what you're taking. And two is, as you guys all know, we adjust medicines all the time, right? I, I feel like be even between the three or four or five months between I see patients, I'm adjusting medicines one, two, three times. We're changing medicines, we're changing dosages, and pill packs don't keep up very well for changing medicines. They are good, and they are helpful, but you have to be a little bit careful with them. Agreed. Ours come from a pharmacy about 12 miles away, and they've been really great about changing. Good. Now, if you had to get it in the mail, I wouldn't do it. But this has helped me enormously. They Sorry. deliver personally, the driver brings it in. No problem exchanging uh, if there's change in medication. Good. Yeah. My neurologist is Timothy Greenemeyer, <laughs> and he's Good name. Been, I've been taking uh, Azelec ever since I was first diagnosed. A couple of visits ago, I asked him if it was doing any good and should I continue taking it. And he said, I don't know, you could give it up for a while and see what happens. I said, no, thank you. But, 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 what's, but what's your view on Azelec? As a I like Azelec. So we, a long time ago, back in the day, we thought maybe Azelec was disease modifying. Um, you know, there's some conflicting data about that. But we, we put a lot of people on it because it's one a day, which is better than every other medicine that I have. Very well tolerated and, and fairly mild. Um, it probably isn't disease modifying, again, based on the data, but we still use it. It is an adjunct. It still does help. But um, I have two comments on that. So one is I am a big, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of guy. And so if it's working and you're doing well and you like it, keep doing it. Two is that's exactly how I also figure out if medicines are working. I have a lot of patients that come to me and say, hey, I'm on this medicine. I don't know if it's doing anything. Should I, what do we do? Let's take it away. Let's find out. Let's see what happens. If you take it away and you miss it, you're worse. Things are happening. Hey, it was probably doing more than we thought. Go back on it. If you take it away and nothing changes, well, then it's not really doing anything, and we don't want you to take medicines that aren't doing anything. So I do the same thing. So I think it was a good idea, but I probably lean more towards if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Thank you. Well, that's a confusing. I was first. <laughs> Go ahead. I have a question for you. Um, currently, my husband's legs get so stiff at night, they're like boards and I have to help him move his legs to get out of bed. I'm not sure what's causing that. Is that a normal thing for Parkinson's? Is he too much medication, not enough of medication, or does he need a different medication? Yes. <laughs> One of those is probably right. Um, is, is it normal? I don't know, it's not normal, but does it, have I heard that before? Yeah, I hear the stiffness and rigidity and movement and getting in and out of bed and rolling over in bed and getting in and out of a car, standing up out of a chair. These are problems for a whole lot of people. Could it be he needs more medicine? Maybe. Um, you know, that generally it does work on stiffness, help people move a little bit better. Could it be too much medicine? Some people do get on kind of peak dose dyskinesias and dystonias as well, so it's possible. Does he need something completely different? Maybe. I mean, again, there's only one way to find that out too. 
keys to success here for you are going to be paying attention to timing. So how does it relate to the medicines in terms of what he's taking, when's he taking it, how does it seem to react, what else has he tried, what, what really is it, what is it like, how does it seem, what do we think is the cause, and then really communication. It may come down to, well, let's try something and see what happens, either take it away or add more, and then if we go the wrong way, whoops, let's backtrack and figure out the other way. But Communication is key and trying to pay as close of attention to those things as you can in terms of medication timing, how they're doing and so forth is probably going to help you guess right. What do you do about excessive bodily fluids, sneezing, drooling, and um, seems to happen a lot at mealtime? Yeah, I say that stinks. Uh, and then I say, well, there's a few things we can do. So it depends on what it is. So if it's saliva, secretions, drooling, there are some medicines that we use. There are some injections that I do. So some botulinum toxin can help. Uh, if it's excessive sweating or things like that, that's a much harder problem. I haven't had a lot of success with that. And you just try to pick and choose what you can work on. Is there a medicine that I can come up with? Or is, there a me is this a side effect of medicines that we need to adjust? Trying to figure out what the cause is and is there something that's at least relatively easy that isn't going to cause more problems that maybe we could do about it. But that is a very hard problem to fix, and I don't know if I have a good solution. I have a I've been on this side for a while. Hold on. Yes. Yes, I have recently received uh, separate emails from the University of Pennsylvania and West Virginia Health about uh, uh, webinars for focused uh, ultrasound. What, are, what do you know about that, and what benefits, if any, are there? I'm going to try to do this in a very short amount of time. So we learned a long time ago that putting a hole in somebody's brain can stop them from shaking. Um, fast forward to about five or six years ago, we learned that you could put a hole in somebody's brain with ultrasound waves under an MRI guidance. It's approved for essential tremor. It's approved for tremor predominant Parkinsonism. They're looking at it for other things, so on and so forth. At the end of the day, my, my interpretation of it, and we don't have one in Pittsburgh. I can't do it at Allegheny Health Network. I don't think they have it at UPMC. The closest is down at WVU or Cleveland Clinic. Um, is that it predominantly works for tremors more than it works for other symptoms. And so I have sent some essential tremor patients for it and I have had good results. Now I, I say that because you can only do one side right now. And so again, from an essential tremor standpoint, these are patients who shake when they do stuff. If I take care of their dominant hand, they can now write, they can eat, they can perform function. And if their left hand shakes, well, that's not that big of a deal. In Parkinson's disease, because it's not just a tremor and there's so many other aspects of it, and it is both sides that really impact things like walking and balance and the, mo the really important things, I haven't, I've been hesitant to send Parkinson's patients for it. Uh, I may have sent one or two just to get an evaluation, but I haven't had any of my patients do it just yet until I see how it actually does for patients with Parkinson's disease and get a little bit more experience with it. Um, and so that's my quick and dirty thought on the high frequency ultrasound ablation. I will have more to come on that as more research comes out. They're looking at bilateral symptoms. They're looking at different targets to target the other symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And so I think that's a area of hot topic in the near future, but right now I'm still up in the air on it. I have one simple question. My wife, Diane, who's had Parkinson's for over 30 years, uh, became diagnosed with COVID and then she was diagnosed to take Paxlovid. Uh, the end result was a, quite a few different challenges that she faced. Has that been looked into as far as anybody else with Parkinson's and reactions with Parkinson's medication? I thought you said it was going to be simple. <laughs> um, not to my knowledge in terms of publication. I have had patients similar to that, who have gotten COVID and had problems, who have gotten Paxlovid and had problems, who have gotten the vaccines and had problems. I have heard, seen, and, and talked to all of the above, but I don't know that we've necessarily uncovered the mechanism, what it actually means, what's causing it, and what to do about it. And so the short answer is, is not enough to know just yet to really give you a good answer. Uh-oh, we're, we're turning pages there. I'm in trouble. You only get one. Um, is a side effect of medication the orthostatic hypotension? You tell me. Well, my husband, you know, for years took 10 milligrams of lisinopril for high blood pressure, and all of a sudden, 
looks like it started January the 7th, and now he has orthostatic hypoplasia. And it's a tough one. So at the end of the day, <clears throat> a lot of my patients start off with high blood pressure. They're on lisinopril, they're on beta blockers, they're on blood pressure medicines. And as the disease progresses, Parkinson's disease itself can cause lower blood pressure, can cause neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. But we also know the medicines do that. And so I put people on carbidopa, levodopa. I put them on different medicines that also lower the medicines. And so a lot of my patients end up either decreasing their anti-high blood pressure medicines or going off of them completely. But it's unclear, is this just the progression of the disease? Is this a side effect of the medicine? Is it a combination of all of the above? Was this something they were going to get anyway? I don't know what the underlying cause is in any given case, but at the end of the day, it's something that's important to note and really pay attention to because passing out, falling, getting lightheaded and dizzy are really, really bad ideas. Um, and, and so even though I don't know the answer to your question in terms of it, is it his